Um, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Sue Moore. I'm speaking from Bundjalung country and I want to welcome you all to the um, Birthing on Country Centre for Research Excellence monthly um, seminar that we hold. Um, I want to welcome um, all of you and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future and to all First Nations people in the room and everybody else who's joined us today. Um, we're absolutely thrilled to have um, our guest speakers today who are really grateful that they were able to make the time in their busy schedules to come along and speak to us. Today we've got Joss Hill, we've got um, sorry, Melina O'Connor and Sunita Judis. And they're going to be telling us today about their work um, with, um, and the title of their talk is uh, Queensland's Growing Deadly Family Strategy. And um, they've got a PowerPoint that they'll be showing, but they might want to introduce themselves in a little bit more detail and uh, who they are and where they're coming from. Thank you very much. Over to you, J um, Joss. Thank you. Sunita or Melina, do you want to just give us a little bit of a heads up on where you're from? Uh, I know you're based in Queensland, but um, so it'd be at Queensland Health. Um, so uh, Sunita and I are um, CMCs and midwife coordinators um, specifically for the Growing Deadly Families and we sit in the office of the Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer um, in Brisbane. Um, just on Butterfield Street across from the Royal Brisbane Hotel, I was going to say, hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Not much of one, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. We also both one identify. <laughs> Maybe I just, I will just talk to it rather than, would that be all right if I just talk? It's a bit of a yeah, shame. Yeah, that's whatever's easiest. <laughs> Okay, given I don't have the PowerPoint, I'll just um, talk to it. So my, my apologies. But um, I'm Jocelyn Tuhill. I'm the Director of Midwifery and the Chief Nursing and Midwifery Office in um, Department of Health um, in Queensland. And, um, okay, something funny is starting to come up now. Um, so I'd just like to thank you, Suzanne, uh, most sincerely for the opportunity to meet with you and your guest today. Um, it is a great privilege for me to present with you and uh, my uh, midwifery colleagues, Sunita and Melina. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we are each respectively meeting on today. For me, this is the Turrbal and Yuggera peoples, the traditional custodians of the lands and waters of the Brisbane area, and I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. I think we are all very well aware of our geographical differences and distances. However, to put Queensland in context, Queensland has 16 hospital and health services in the public system. 15 of these health services provide a maternity service and there are 38 services with birthing on site and five without birthing support on site. Those uh, services are all rural, Theodore, Charters Towers, Chinchilla, Mossman and Weeper. Queensland covers 1.2 million kilometres and is 2,400 kilometres long from the tip of the Cape to the New South Wales border. There is less distance to travel internationally from Sydney to Auckland than it is to travel within Queensland from Thursday Island to Brisbane. Brisbane is closer to Melbourne in Victoria than Brisbane is to Cairns in our own state. And Queensland is five times the size of the United Kingdom. So as such, Queensland Health is often looking at how to improve access to healthcare and maternity services. It's not surprising that access to birth facilities in rural and remote is challenging. In 2018 through to 2019, and in response to consumer and media coverage, the then health, health minister set up a rural maternity task force. The purpose was to engage with key stakeholders in rural and remote Queensland regarding access to and provision of safe and sustainable woman-centered care. It was to gain an understanding of the issues, concerns and expectations in rural and remote communities. There was a public submission process from December 2018 through to February 2019 with over 3,000, uh, sorry, over 300 responses. Rural and remote forums were conducted across five rural sites across the state. 
and then there was data analysis undertaken of perinatal outcomes in rural and remote areas compared with um, urban areas and an analysis of the factors that influence those variations. The task force was then to provide a report with recommendations that support and enable provision of suitable woman-centred care as close as possible to where the women live, whilst enabling good outcomes for mothers and babies in rural and remote communities. This included development of a decision guide to support decision-making on rural and remote maternity service provision. The Queensland planning framework for rural and remote maternity services was developed and guides hospital and health services to analyse their local data and service information, which includes network services. It includes the inclusion of doing an analysis using the Australian Rural Maternity Index, and then based on that information, if it's suitable to develop a birth, birthing service locally. According to that, um, the clinical services capability framework would be sourced to identify the appropriate resources. The guide also helped the HHSs understand how to review consumer and community feedback and information, and also information from clinicians and, their, and take on board their feedback. The guide assesses, helps assess maternity service system risks, including cultural risks. As we know, care must not only be clinically safe, it must feel safe to consumers. Moving forward to support rural services, the Office of Rural and Remote Health established, um, was established to implement the six recommendations of the task force report. Um, it was to identify sustainable me mechanisms for services, to investigate workforce, and to make cultural shift to collaboration and co-design with consumers and other key stakeholders. One of the clinicians uh, at the sites we visited advised us that the birthing journey is a major milestone in life. It's not just clinical, it's cultural, spiritual and family. It's more than just, in inverted commas, delivering, I'll say birthing, a baby. It's so much more. So one of the first areas of the Office of the Rural and Remote Health uh, was looking at workforce, given the difficulty in attracting and retaining all disciplines of workforce. Affordable and family-friendly accommodation has been identified as a major challenge, along with access to childcare to support employment. COVID has certainly been a significant impact to all of us and with staffing challenges further compounded by vaccine mandates and isolation of a number of rural and remote communities to protect COVID spread into Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Sustaining rural maternity services does remain challenging. However, since the Rural Task Force, two rural maternity services have been progressed. Chinchilla in Darling Downs, which is approximately 300 kilometres from Brisbane, began operating a midwifery group practice for women who made birth in Dolby, which is 80 kilometres away, with their midwife attending, or for women with complex pregnancies, their birth occurring in Toowoomba, a further 85 kilometres away. Weeper in far north Queensland, which is 500 kilometres by road or two hour flight to Cairns, is in final infrastructure completion and commences local birth for women of low obstetric complexity in August. So very, very close. Staff have been appointed and this will complete three rural birthing sites in Torres and Cape and offer all women accessing services in the Torres and Cape Hospital and Health Service, MGP care. And that occurs at Thursday Island, um, Cooktown, and also in Weeper. The Rural and Remote Maternity Services Planning Framework, developed out of the Rural Maternity Task Force, is to be used with a broader statewide maternity services decision making framework. The Queensland Maternity Services Decision Making Framework has been developed to assist hospital and health services to transition to maternity continuity of care models. Transitioning to maternity continuity of care models requires careful planning and considerations around the trajectory for rollout and ways to demonstrate the concept and benefits of the model. The decision-making framework consists of 41 questions under the themes of strategy, structure and process, people and technology, and is aimed to provoke thoughtful consideration around the organisation of change 
as well as considerations about population characteristics, workforce, geography, and the technological infrastructure required that affect the change the proposed model of care is delivered. The decision-making framework li links to a maternity models of care toolkit, which provides users with specific resources that will assist in their change journey. <coughs> The Office of the Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer seeks to influence, innovate and transform the two professions of midwifery and nursing through strategic pieces of work. For the midwifery program, we are seeking to make midwives more visible and highlight the importance and value of midwives. A large component of work is growing midwifery continuity. Four recent and current programs include the Model of Care and Career Pathways project across the first 1,000 days the Queensland Normal Birth Strategy, the QMID model, and the Growing Deadly Family Strategy. Career Pathways and Models of Care Across the First 1,000 Days investigated and scoped the intersection of midwifery and nursing roles for child and family health, and it looks to improve and support maternal, child, and family primary health care across the first 1,000 days. It identified career pathways and models of care that capitalise on evidence and existing continuity of carer relationship-based models. The four continuity models enables through, it, through one, of, one or any of them to um, provide for women in any geographical um, area or any demographic. The, model, the first model was to extend continuity of midwifery care or MGP care beyond the first six weeks with integration of midwives holding a maternal and child health qualification over the first two years of life. The second model was to integrate MGP to incorporate maternity and child health during the antenatal and postnatal period for seamless care. The third was to have connected hub and spoke model of the MGP from the remote site to an MGP at the birth site and back again. And the final model was a peer support model or navigator service. Through these, women could have connected care. Because um, many midwives, the majority of, of the um, midwives in Queensland graduate from a bachelor midwifery program, and there has been barriers for those midwives to enter into um, educational um, programs and to gain their qualification in child health. We provided in line with the first model that I described scholarships for nine staff uh, from graduating from bachelor midwifery programs. There were nine candidates, three of whom were First Nations. The nine have all completed their child health qualification now. So it was a 100% completion rate. The Queensland Normal Birth Strategy, developed by consumers, midwives, obstetricians, academics, through a co-designed evidence-based multi-pronged strategy, is to address high rates of cesarean section. There are five core principles that underpin the Queensland Normal Birth Strategy, and they are to change the culture to promote normal birth and mitigate fear of birth. It's to centre women's informed decision-making, access and control, to bring about respect and the scope of practice for midwives, obstetricians and other maternity providers who feel that they have lost that um, effect. It's also to provide uh, cost-effective evidence-based solutions and to privilege consumer voices in service design and delivery. The five recommendations from that group in developing the Queensland Normal Birth Strategy are that there be universal access to continuity of midwifery care models, including publicly funded home birth in Queensland. Queensland remains one of two um, areas without a publicly funded home birth model. Multidisciplinary normal birth education is to be provided uniformly. Co-designed resources to facilitate informed decision-making and initiatives, initiatives developed to embed respectful maternity care and a positive workforce culture. And also to establish a sustainable normal birth collaborative to drive that work. To support rural and remote maternity services, de dedicated midwifery advisors have been appointed to Queensland Retrieval Services under the QMID program.
The QMED program provides in-time support across Tuesday to Saturday. Um, the midwives work part-time in QMED and are expert midwives and are also working within a health service to remain current or are working in private practice. We're hoping to grow this model further across seven days a week. Additionally, additional to this are planned education sessions across the week. These are attended by multidisciplinary team members and assist in promoting and growing the expertise of midwives. But also these education sessions are receiving great feedback from junior doctors, rural nurses, and also paramedics. The Growing Deadly Families program is also a current key body of the project of the office. And I will now hand over to Sunita and Melina. Thank you and my apologies for no screen. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Melina Connors. I am one of the midwifery coordinators in the Growing Deadly Family Strategy. Um, I am a proud Gurindji woman from the Northern Territory. Um, and I'm Sunita Judith. I'm a proud Gungaree and Waka Waka woman. Um, we would just like to pay our respects to the ancestors of this country, especially the lands in which we all meet on today. Elders, knowledge holders and leaders, past, present and emerging. We give our gratitude to the many people who generously contributed to the development of the Growing Deadly Family Strategy. We are particularly grateful to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who contributed their experience and cultural knowledge. Um, so we'll be using this artwork throughout our presentation and it's designed by um, Arnie Elaine Chambers Hegarty and it will be used throughout. Um, we also just want to let you know that we may refer to the Growing Deadly Families as GDF, um, as it's always referred to in our office, so we apologise. Um, and that we also might refer to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as our mob, because they're our mob. <laughs> so the, as you may be aware, statistics for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and babies is very different to the non-Indigenous women and babies. So we, the Growing Deadly Family Strategy was based off these statistics in 2016 and 18. Well, so no we are aware some of these statistics may be better um, moving forward with the growth that we've had in this space. Um, however, so in Queensland of location, the majority of women that give birth to Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander babies live outside major cities. And for those mothers uh, living in remote areas, 41% of them travelled outside their HHS to give birth. 93% of the women received their internal care in the public and 98% are in the public hospital. Um, one in 10 mums were, were teenagers. So teenager mums have um, different clinical, social, emotional and psychological needs to compare to the older women. However, the older women, which is the women aged 35 and over, have the increased risk of poorer birth outcomes. 58% of our mothers had early first trimester and frequent, which is five or more antenatal visits. Timing of and sufficient antenatal um, visits is associated with better birth outcomes. Most Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies are born in a health, uh, in healthy birth weight range, which is the 2,500 to the 4,499 grams. However, the one and two are not, um, are at a higher risk of poor health outcomes throughout life. A high proportion of our women that give birth to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies have pre-existing health conditions such as diabetes or cardiovascular disease. Um, and this does impact on pregnancy health outcomes. A relatively high proportion of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies are born preterm. So this carries that with the risk of being stillbirth, having disabilities in childhood and chronic diseases in adulthood. And smoking still remains high within our mob. Um, this increases the complications in pregnancy and poor outcomes for our babies. The GDF strategy's vision is that all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies in Queensland are born healthy into strong, resilient families. This happens when mothers are healthy before and during pregnancy, increasing the likelihood of full-term pregnancies and babies being born at a healthy birth weight. The aim of the GDF strategy is to ensure that every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander woman in Queensland giving birth to an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander baby has access to high quality clinical and culturally capable maternity service. The development of this strategy has been informed by various forums and task force outcomes that identified key areas of improvement for maternity services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Queenslanders. 
Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, health professionals working in maternity care and communities have all contributed to these forums. In November 2016, a statewide maternity service forum was held that resulted in the establishment of three maternity service action groups. These groups identified actions that could be applied across the health system to improve access to and the quality of outcomes for mothers and babies accessing maternity services. The Maternity Services Forum highlighted challenges for maternity services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and the need for strong culturally competent care. The forum identified three key themes, a collaborative leadership culture within maternity services, identification and management of risk in pregnancy, and models of care and workforce. It was decided that a further forum was required focusing on the needs of our women and families. In August 2017, the Queensland Department of Health, the Queensland Clinical Senate, Health Consumers Queensland, Queensland Aboriginal and Islander Health Council and the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health collaborated to convene the Growing Deadly Families, a healthy start for mums and bubs forum in Brisbane. The forum allowed for participants to discuss many of the issues and barriers that exist for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families throughout their maternity journey. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women spoke of the challenges of birthing away from home, often having to stay away for long periods of time in unfamiliar places, surrounded by unfamiliar people and without the support of their family and community. The forum also heard women talk about the lack of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff within the hospital, which can lead to a lack of understanding of cultural knowledge and practices, and then leaves a feeling of insecurity and disconnection. So the key outcomes for the for, uh, from the forum were we want to say in how our maternity services are designed and delivered. We don't want to keep telling our same story to different people and we want more of our people providing maternity care. Following the forum, an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander maternity service leadership group was established to progress the action on the theme emerging from the forum and to give the development of an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander maternity services strategy. From 2017 to 2018, GDF strategy was co-designed alongside the Queensland Health and Queensland Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community that was released in 2019. The Growing Deadly Family strategy outlined three key deliverables and priorities. Partnership for governance and leadership, continuity of carer, and embedding an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce and support into health services. Priority one stated, we want to say in how maternity services are designed and delivered. The first key priority is having the continuity of care and models co-designed with the community. This would mean that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, families and communities are all designed, uh, sorry, are all involved in the design and delivery of maternity services through strong partnerships between service providers. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are supported to establish and lead Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Islander maternity services. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community controlled health organisations, the hospitals, health service and consumers all come together to co-design a model that's specific to the local area's needs. We understand and respect that each community has a different need. A community voice and input into the co-design means that the voices of our families are being heard and the needs will be met. It's about developing a long-term sustainable approach for the hospital, the medical service and the community to maintain the resources, supports and services ongoing. This priority incorporates the following strategies. Partnership and collaborative women-centred maternity care. Establish or strengthen formal partnerships between hospitals and primary health care providers to support collaborative women-centred maternity care services. Leadership and collaboration. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community consultation, leadership and co-design occurs using a collaborative governance approach, including ensuring clinical governance supports and the approach of collaboration also. So priority two states, we don't want to keep telling our same story to different people. It's important for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mothers and families to have continuity of care throughout their antenatal birthing and postnatal journey and where possible, co-locating wraparound social supports and allied health in a culturally safe space. It is extremely well known that cult sorry, it is extremely well known that continuity models of care improve outcome for women and their infants. As clinicians working with mothers and family, it is documented 
documented and well known to have less burnout, depression and anxiety for practitioners in practice. Our families want to see their mob every time they're in hospital or accessing a medical service. We don't want to keep telling our story over and over. Continuity of care and model improves cultural responsiveness, responsiveness care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. This priority incorporates the following strategies. So continuity of care, establishing and recognising a model of best practice to facilitate a collaborative approach to maternity care with care providers of their choice. Integrated health and other support services. Support integration with the community control sector and other social support services and the frequent antenatal care. Transferring women for birth. So women travelling in the remote and remote rural communities for birth are provided with a holistic support to navigate accommodation, travel and cultural considerations are factored in, including telehealth services. The family wellbeing. So communities being involved in the design of antenatal and parenting programs to strengthen the family, culture and community connections. Information sharing, referrals and follow-ups. Providing a seamless transfer for tertiary to primary healthcare facilities through connected referrals and accurate and timely sharing of discharge summaries. Priority three states, we want more of our people providing our maternity care. This is about embedding Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce and support into the health services. Growing a culturally capable workforce, meaning that more of our mob are employed, trained and supported across all disciplines of maternity care. This is from the ground level up to management and leadership. Encouraging more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to take up careers across all disciplines in health, in particular maternity, go, go the midwives, and supporting skills development and training will help to build the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce. Building the cultural capability of non-Indigenous staff will encourage support for more culturally capable healthcare system and encourage more of our people to work in the health system as they're feeling supported. A culturally capable workforce means Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across all disciplines of maternity care. This will lead to an increase of ident identified positions within the hospital health services, supporting the recruitment, retention and engagement of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander student midwives and graduates, cadetships for midwifery students with identified pathways to newly qualified midwifery positions, an upskilling of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander midwives leadership capabilities, including mentorship, and scholarships for supporting Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander midwives to become endorsed midwives and then be able to work to their full scope. Investing in these three key deliverables is the birth of developing a sustainable models of care to co-design and improve Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander maternal and infant health outcomes, which we know contributes to the Council of Australian Governments closing the gap policy and Queensland's health's making tracks towards closing the gap in health outcomes for Indigenous Queenslanders by 2033. This strategy identifies characteristics to improve access to culturally and clinically appropriate and safe maternal health services for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mothers and babies that embed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ways of knowing, being and doing into the development of culturally safe maternity services. So the co-design relationship. So the slideshow shows Melina and I in Mount Isa. Uh, that is the middle photo is us in um, Metro North in the Narama Community Day with the CNC Strong Start to Life Tara Denaro. And um, Melina and I are at um, Ingham Hospital with Vander, who works in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Division. Um, so, um, so we just want to use the, oh, sorry, I've missed something, sorry. Um, at present, Melina and I are meeting and greeting with key stakeholders in the key location where they establish First Nation-led models of areas of care as relationships and partnerships take time and effort to understand and build trust and rapport with all stakeholders, most importantly, First Nations, First Nations people and community. This process requires co-designing models of, of care that are integrated and require flexibility to adapt the changes and needs of the community. The implementation of the GDF strategy is being led by the Office of the Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer with support from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Division to, do, to achieve all deliverables outlined in the strategy. This consists of an establishment of a project management office within OCNAMO to support implementation as a part of the office. There's myself and Melina. Our primary roles are to assist with the co-design process. 
The roles that Melina and I play in the strategy as midwife co-coordinators is important, but one of the most important part of our roles is that we have lived experience as Aboriginal women and midwives working in, in the mainstream healthcare system. That we are the faces that our mobs see that are advocating for the need of their particular communities and that we get it. As First Nations midwives, we've held the hands and supported our mob that are birthing within our facilities. We know firsthand the impacts of birthing away from their families and community and the stresses that come along with this. To create a culturally safe maternity service, you need to ensure the representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their organisations are at the forefront of the collaboration process where the services are being designed. The aim of Melina and I the aim of Melina and I is to bring all the healthcare providers, consumers and organisations to discuss ways that we can create the most integrated journey for maternity care. So co-design is not a consultation. It is a partnership that is built on trust and relationship. Co-design for each organisation and community is different. It does not have a one-size-fits approach all, and that's why the role of the midwife co-coordinators is so important as we have the clinical and cultural knowledge in this area. We support all HHSs and community controlled sectors by sharing their cultural and clinical knowledge from multiple sites currently in the co-design process. We use many tools to help facilitate and support co-design, such as the RISE framework, the Rural Maternity Task Force, the Midwifery Continuity of Care and Cost Modelling Tool, and the Maternity Services Decision Making Framework. Sorry. The public health system and the community controlled health sector and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities must work collaboratively collaboratively to ensure that services are integrated, connected and tailored to the local community setting. Local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and organisations must be supported to lead, be actively involved in, in the decision making, planning, delivery and governance of the maternity service for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people within Queensland. This strategy highlights the key attribute that underpin the provision of culturally capable maternity care for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and their babies. This will in turn lead to improved outcomes. The model of care is centered around mums, babies, families, and community, because if you can't be clinically appropriate without being culturally appropriate. Um, there are just some more pictures of um, Sunita and I on some more of our site visits. Um, and also with um, Hayleen Grogan and Roy Ann West. Uh, the strategy provides direction to maternity service in Queensland of implementing a collaborative approach with representatives from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Division, the Queensland Aboriginal and Islander Health Council and the Office of the Chief Nursing and Midwifery Officer to improve the health of First Nations people. Um, so there's just some pictures here. I did see Teresa Simpson on a little while ago. So shout out to the Mukai Rosie team. Um, we did a little Taurus and Kate tour. So um, part, we, we've been really fortunate to be able to travel statewide and learn about the current maternity services that are being offered, um, but also the challenges across the state as well. Um, some of the pictures of our recent travel, um, I mean, we're all looking happy and um, excited, but it was a good, um, good experience for us to be able to travel and we're not pregnant um, and fly in some of those little planes or in some of those conditions um, with our suitcases full of toiletries and suitable clothing to see how um, our mums and families are having to travel to birth off country and sometimes that with little or no notice at all. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, um, we acknowledged um, where we were from, Sunita and I, um, and we just wanted to read an excerpt from the NAIDOC 2021 theme of Hill Country um, as a little bit of an understanding of why it's important as an Aboriginal person um, when we identify the country that we're from and what it means to us. Country is inherent to our identity. It sustains our lives in every aspect, spiritually, physically, emotionally, socially and culturally. It is more than a place. When we talk about country, it is spoken of like a person. Country is family, kin, law, ceremony, traditions and language. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, it has been this way since the dawn of time. Through our languages and songs, we speak to country. Through our ceremonies and traditions, we sing to and celebrate country and country speak to us. Increasingly, we worry about country. 
For generations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been calling for stronger measures to recognise, protect and maintain all aspects of our culture and heritage for all Australians. This includes the right for our women and families to be able to birth on their country. With a strong culture and our strong women, we can make some strong families for a stronger future. So we just want to acknowledge that um, the Growing Deadly Families is um, very successful because we have um, the health equity um, strategies currently going, but we actually incorporate the health equity principles into our maternity care. So we want to ensure that we're culturally safe and to be culturally safe, um, to be clinically safe, you have to be culturally safe and vice versa, that we're empowering our First Nation voices and supporting our leadership and that we're building a, the workforce. Um, you can make a difference. Be brave, make the change. Are there any questions? Do I cancel the sharing? Thank you to you both. That was an excellent presentation. Congratulations on the amazing work that you're doing. It's really impressive. Um, just, uh, excellent. I'm wondering, um, does any, Amanda Carter has a question if you would like to, uh, to take the floor. Actually, I don't. I was just clapping. Sorry. Oh, I thought it was a yeah. fantastic presentation. Congratulations to the leader and Melina, and also to Jocelyn for, for leading these initiatives. So, congratulations. Thank you. We do get Selena um, just with our name. So, if you say <laughs> Selena, Selena, Melina, Melina, Selena's okay as well. <laughs> I did have a question. I was wondering, you talked a lot about building the uh, First Nations workforce. So how do you actually get people interested in the first place? Do you go to schools or do you just meet people at clinics who you think might be interested or how do you approach it? We talk within the strategy about building our workforce. So we're talking about um, in the workforce, we're talking about everyone being identified. That's from transport to health workers to your midwives up through to your executive level. Um, we have a high focus on the health worker within, um, within our strategy or, or in some organisations they are using the family support worker. Um, but we just have been involved in a few things. So we have been um, asked to speak at the Deadly Start, which is just letting our young ones coming through, knowing that there is a pathway, that there are um, that you can inspire to be midwives and by having role models around them. Um, or people that they can touch base with, they know that they can achieve those goals. Um, yeah, so we're planning, fingers crossed, to go to Torres and Cape and maybe present at their high school, just about midwifery as a profession and, and being identified midwives ourselves. And, and you're right, Susan, it is about engaging um, at the high school level. So there were discussions around, especially when we're in Torres and Cape, in regards to attending um, careers days, um, having a presence, I think um, being able to see someone that um, is, is an identified um, or who looks like you and um, has come from the same background and has been able to achieve something. So it's um, there is a team working around the workforce component of the Growing Deadly Families. Um, and it's not really what Snigger and I are doing, but heavily involved in promoting um, any programs within that workforce strategy, but yeah, definitely starting with school as well. I forgot to mention um, Katznam and some of our funded sites are actually doing cadetships um, to putting students through um, university to have paid placements or um, going into and actually working in an identified service. Um, so we do have lots of um, development going on in that space as well. Yeah, it's excellent. Any other questions? I do. It's Teresa here. Sorry, I don't know where to put my hand up in this on this little area here, but awesome presentation, ladies. Well done. Um, I just wanted to ask, how are you going with um, some of the challenges that you're having um, with getting with the Up and Weeper? Have you addressed some of the staffing issues that you have? And sorry, I missed the front of the presentation, but I'm not sure whether you had mentioned it in there. Joss, did we hand this one over to you? Yes, sure. So um, they are fully staffed uh, now. I think the only position that they, I think there is one, it's more the um, medical side of staffing that they seem to be having a problem with at the moment. But we were up there um, last month, was it, four weeks ago, um, 
and um, yeah, they're ready to go. Basically, they're just finalising the infrastructure. Um, their birthing um, suite looks absolutely amazing and they've really tried to have a focus on it being so welcoming for First Nations. Um, yeah, no, they're, they're definitely on track and they um, are committed to be opening in August. Okay. And what accommodation opportunities do you have? About that. We didn't ask that. I don't think um, we were... Yeah, look, I don't know, but I do know that they're ready to go. So I'd say their staff have been accommodated well, but that you're absolutely right. Accommodation is always a challenge, always a challenge. Mm, okay, thank you. No more questions from me. Thanks, Teresa. Anybody else who have a Oh, uh, yeah, hi. Um... So it's Penny here. I'm on the beautiful lands of the Ewan Nation on the south coast of New South Wales, um, quite some distance. But thank you so much, all of you, for a really interesting presentation. Um, I've got a few family members up there in southern part of Queensland, but I wouldn't mind spending a bit more time up there. But yeah, didn't realise the incredible distances and challenges and I mean, what incredible goals you have of um, making continuity of care accessible to everybody and setting up publicly funded home births, not to mention this um, growing Deadly Families program. So thank you so much, really learned a lot. I'm really interested in multidisciplinary normal birth education. Like if you've got any feedback about how that's going at the moment. Thanks. Yeah, so that is part of our normal birth strategy. Uh, one of the um, stages of that, um, we are developing, we have a clinical skills development service um, through one of our major tertiary hospitals that are currently developing um, uh, a component of that. The other way is uh, through our QMID program that I spoke about earlier, um, they promote um, a whole range of educational um, um, factors but one of them that they concentrate to is is normal birth and how to facilitate that and um, a beautiful story well you're probably aware you know we've had those terrible floods of recent times and through um, the midwifery advisors the senior midwives on QMID um, through some of the um, women that were stranded there's been some beautiful stories um, where the women not only didn't feel unsafe they felt absolutely protected and the normal birth I guess it's for if we can grow a, a broader community understanding that birth is not something to be fearful of um, is a good thing and so one of the one of the stories that did hit the headlines and I have spoken to the midwife um, the, the midwifery advisor from QMID that was on the teleconference with the um, paramedics um, they have certainly, you know, they do a great job, the paramedics, there's no doubt about it, but they were stranded with this woman as well, had nowhere to go um, with her and um, essentially she continued to, under the direction and the support of the midwife um, through QMID, uh, the paramedics felt such so much more supported themselves and it was interesting, the room that they were in, the midwife had said, look, just dull the lights um, make it a little bit more peaceful. It doesn't have to be all bright lights and sirens. And um, so they did that for the birth. They were absolutely amazed that you didn't have to be so, you know, um, <laughs> staring at everything and dumbfounded by things that, that these women could do such amazing things under their own power. But when the baby was birthed, um, they flicked the lights on and the midwife said, no, 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 just turn the, just lower the lights again, birth's not over yet. And they said they just learnt so much uh, from that experience. So I guess the normal birth um, education comes in ways you don't always um, expect, but it comes from these uh, collective um, things that we're doing that all lead, all roads for me are leading to Rome. And that is that all women have continuity of care. Um, and hopefully of a known midwife. So um, that's what we're building everything to. Thank you, Joss, that's great. I don't think we've got any more questions. So um, we might wrap it up. 
Thank you very much, Joss, Anita and Melina. It was just an excellent presentation. We're really thrilled that you were able to make the time in your busy schedules.